In a moment of panic, calling 911 can be the difference between life and death. And some dispatchers come out as heroes, and others not so loved. This dispatcher's calmness must be unmatched. In August 2012, a panicked woman from Iowa was driving home from visiting a friend when the accelerator in her 2011 Kia Sorento SUV got stuck. Her speed reached 120 miles per hour. 911, where's your emergency? Um, I'm on 35 northbound. I'm at mile marker 86, and my car is just picking up speed. I hit a deer on Friday night, and I didn't think there was very much damage. And the deer, and the car was kind of slowing down, shaking a little bit. Uh huh. And now I called my husband to see what was, you know, what to do. And all of a sudden, it's just kind of picking up speed and picking up speed. And I'm going like 80, almost 90 miles an hour ahead of the best of me. And I'm scared to death. Okay. Are you able to hit your brakes at all? I've tried everything. Okay, have you put... My husband is breaking. Okay, have you put your car in neutral? I can't get it to move. I can't get the car to shut off. Okay, you're at the I-35 headed north towards Bethany by the 86 mile. What's your name? It's Lori. Lori what? Almost dead. Huh? It's U-L-D-E-S-C-A-G. And I just put, I just told my dad I have a full tank of gas. Okay, Lori, what's your phone number in case I lose you? It's And you're not able to stop the vehicle at all, are you? No, I can't. Okay, I want you to stay on the line with me. I'm so scared. Say Joseph from Harrison County. <laughs> Calm down, Lori. I-35 North by the 86 mile marker. A car unable to stop. Individual has put the car in. Is unable to shift the gear. The car is going over 80 miles an hour. Friday, she hit a deer. And now the car won't stop, and she's in motion. Okay, hey, calm down, Lori. Do you have your seatbelt on? I do. Okay. I'm coming up on a bunch of cars. Okay. Oh, that is so scared. Okay, calm down. There's a tiny little bar stuff. Thank you, Joseph. She's coming up into traffic. Can you see what mile marker you're by? Um, I'm at mile marker 90. Thank you, so she's at mile marker 90 right now. Four six eight, go ahead. Here comes the third neutral. She's tried to put it in neutral, it won't shift gear. Okay, turn off the can you turn off the ignition? I want to push start button. I don't have a key. So to say, she has a push button ignition. She doesn't have a key. Can you try and push the button? I pushed it and pushed it and held it down and it's not going to be a key. Lori, can you very slowly put your emergency brake on? I tried. I'm going 98 miles an hour now. Okay, hold on. Course, so call advice is going 98 miles an hour now. Hold on. Is she in an SUV? What, what are you driving? I'm an SUV. I just trust them. She's in an SUV. Can you get this one? Yeah, I'm going 98. Okay, Lori, calm down. I don't know, I can't see 
Okay. Okay. It's okay, Lori. Calm down. It's a Sorrento. It's a Sorrento. Okay, I don't want two semis. She's got two semis. Okay, calm down. She's coming up on two semis. Start honking your horn and flashing your lights. Drop it. No. Boy, are you able to hit your, very slowly hit your emergency brake? Don't, don't, don't do that. No, Lori, don't do that. Okay, calm down. No, Lori, calm down. Can you slowly put the car down in a different gear, like in one or... It won't move. And she just thought about the class. Okay, Lori, push on your brakes and see if you're able to change gears. It's not. Okay, I'm, okay, Lori, just okay. I want you to push on your brakes to see if you can change gears. Hit your brakes. Okay. And now try and change your gears. Down to neutral. What? It's not working. No. Okay. I need one of those. It's all for me. What? I want one of those. I don't want one of those. Please. Please. Oh my God. 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 All right. I know you're scared. Just calm down. What mile marker are you at now? Um. I don't even know. Um, 96. 96. North. She, she passed the troop of the officers. Your gear down that area? Where's the post exam at? Where's the post exam at? Where's Okay, Lori, you see them? They're in front and one's in back of you? Yes. All right, just stay with them. Don't try and pass them. Okay? I know you're scared. But you're doing, you're doing a good job, Lori. Okay. Oh, 
Okay, they're going to try and clear. Okay, Lori, they're going to they're going to clear the roadway. Okay. I'm good. So you're going to you're going to be fine. Just stay with me. I know. Do you want me to update your husband? I'm not going to be scared to death. Okay. He does auto, he loves auto body, he knows everything about cars. Oh, Lori, have you tried to slowly put your emergency brake on? Yes, I have. I have it all the way on. Perfect, but she has the emergency brake all the way on. Okay, 
Lori, I need you to calm down. You're doing fine. Get, get. <laughs> are you in engage, are you able to engage the cruise control? Oh, 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 Can you Lori, can you get your key, Bob? My voice is in the bad thing. Okay. Lori, are you still trying to 
hold down your start button. Lori. In an interview with the news source, Lori Ulfsted said she tried everything from turning off the key to shifting out of drive and slamming on the brakes, but nothing worked. A dash camera video captured by the Missouri State Highway Patrol officers, who soon began following her, shows the terror that Ulfstad went through as her car traveled a distance of 59 miles at speeds as high as 115 miles per hour. In the video, Ulfstad can be seen swerving to dodge cars and driving over the highway median to avoid crashing into other vehicles. In the midst of that, she also reached for a lifeline, using her cell phone to dial 911 and pled with an operator for help. She said, I knew I was going to die. I didn't have any doubt about it. I really thought I was going to die. And no matter what I did, I couldn't slow it down. After 35 minutes of a wild ride, Ulfstad managed to release the accelerator, hit the brake, and finally come to a stop. She suffered no significant injuries in the crash, and the maker of her car, Irvine, said it is working with her on a solution. Lori was praised for how she handled the situation. Patrol spokesperson Sheldon Lyon said, not only to drive fast, but to go into the median, pull back up into the passing lane, and hit that asphalt lip, and not overcorrect, it was really amazing to see her do that repeatedly. Meanwhile, an eight-year-old definitely doesn't get the compassion she needs. Please help me. You promise you will help me? Those were the words of an eight-year-old girl begging a 911 dispatcher for help after her parents were shot in March 2010. It was not until four minutes into the call that the operator said she was sending help. The dispatcher then disconnected the call and left the girl on the phone alone. Emergency 911, we have trouble. Um, my mom is in the basement and um, I need emergency and I need hello. Where at? Um. I'm at, and I'll go ask my mommy. Mommy, uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you where we at. I'll tell you. I need. Let me speak to your mom. No, she's, she's almost dead. Mommy, where are we at? Tell me, I got the police on the phone. Tell me. Mommy, tell me. Where are we at? Where are we at? Where are we at? I said, I called 911. Where are we at? Where are we at? I was outside. I was outside. Yeah, I don't know where we are. Um, I told him, yeah. Um, we are at. I'm outside and. Let me speak to your mom. I don't know who he is. Okay, put um, your mom on the phone if she's here. She's, she's almost dead, please. Okay, she, you, 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 I can't help you without you helping me. Let me see who else in the house. Nobody's else in the house. Okay, you me. need to give me an address. You need to calm down and give me an address. The, uh, I don't know where you're at. You have to give me an address. Address? Is address? Yes. Hello? Yes. Okay. Stop I'm screaming. My mom is almost dead. Okay, you know, yes, ma'am. I huh? need you to calm down and give me a location. Please. Please help me. You promise you will help me? I'm going to help you once you help me, okay? Go on the porch. Can you open up the door? No. Do you see any mail? Uh, no. Um, I can tell you the address. What's the address? Um, uh, if I can find it, um, it is, um, I don't see it, but I'm trying to okay, calm you. down, calm down. Okay. Is there any mail on the table or in a drawer? How old What's are that? you? How old are you? I'm eight years old. Do you see any mail on the table or any mail in the drawer? No. Do you but see any mail on your mom's dresser? My, my mom doesn't live here. 
Okay, you were just screaming at your mom. Who? Okay, who okay, do you live I, with? Huh? Who do you live with? I live with my mother. Your Damn. mother? Yes. I'll, okay. I'll look, look on her dresser. You just said your mom don't live there. Yeah, but I'm looking. I'm looking for everything, and I can't find nothing. Please. She almost dead. Okay, you need to calm down and find me something with an address. I can't help you without an address. Uh, okay, I'll try to look outside again. Open the you. door. Open up the door and look at the at the porch what? up on the What's porch. Open up the door. Look okay. on the porch. Give me those numbers off your porch. All right. You said no one else is there. I hear someone in the back. Oh, that's my sister. Okay, I'm coming. How old is your sister? Okay, okay, I know her address now. How what? old is your sister? She's six. Um, I'm, I know her address now. What is the street? Um, is it, I can tell you, um, this, but it's... You have to tell me the street. Okay, it's... Was Black it and big? Yes. Is and it I a need, house or is this a, a family flat? It's a house. Um, what is wrong with your mom? She got shot. Somebody shot her? Yes. Who shot your mom? I don't know who's the guy. Where's your mom at? Downstairs in the basement. Who is the guy? I don't know. She was just some guy. Is she bleeding from where? Yes, yeah, she's bleeding from, I don't know, from her head or something. I think it's from her head. Okay, I request police in the mask. She's still breathing. Um, My dad is not. Your dad? Hey, let me speak to your dad. No, he's dead. My mom is still breathing. So he, your mom and dad was shot? Yes. In an attempt to send help, the dispatcher tried to have the distraught child locate any type of address so that she knew where to send needed aid. The young girl could read off the first few letters of the street name, which helped authorities locate the Northwest Detroit home. When officers arrived, they found the eight-year-old and her six-year-old half-sister upstairs. According to Detroit Police Chief Warren Evans, the two girls were the only ones at the house during the shooting that killed their 26-year-old mother, Monica Botello, and her 26-year-old boyfriend, Purcell Carson. However, the girls didn't witness the actual altercation. The children were reportedly visiting the home at the time of the shooting, which is why the girl didn't know the address. Investigators reported that the couple might have been gunned down by an acquaintance. Derek Smith and another suspect were the main suspects for the murder of the couple. A warrant for first-degree murder was issued for Smith. According to state correction records, the 42-year-old had convictions for kidnapping, armed robbery, and assault dating back to 1986. Records also showed that Carson had served a bid for a drug offense and was in jail with Smith. The 911 dispatcher was accused of responding cold-heartedly to a child pleading for help as her mother lay dying and had been disciplined. Police Chief Evans said that the dispatcher acted appropriately by sending a car in a timely fashion, but added that she could have shown more sensitivity towards the girl as she discovered her mother and her mother's boyfriend had been fatally shot. Reporters added that the call was made from a cell phone, making it harder to track the exact location, whereas a landline would have made it easier to find the address. If you're a true 911 fan, don't forget to like this video. A call from a 14-year-old Ohio teen has left her family with questions unanswered, even years later. In February 2017, Mariah Ponder placed this panic-stricken call, saying she had shot her father, 71-year-old James Allen Ponder, in their Hamilton home. 911, what's the address of the emergency? Hi, the address is... Yes, Hamilton, what, Ohio. Okay, what's going on there? Can somebody tell me? <laughs> okay, I need to know what's going on. I'm sorry. What's going on at... Can somebody come and put me in here and Why? I just showed my dad. What? I just showed my dad. Please. You just did what to your dad? 
I just shot him. You just and shot your dad? Okay. Where's your dad? He's in the bedroom. Okay, what's your name? Okay. And it's... Right? Yes, and my mom is at work. Your mom's at work? Okay. And your dad is in the bedroom? Yes, I'm all fine. Where did you shoot your dad? In the head? Where's the gun? It's in the bedroom. It's in the bedroom? Nothing. You don't have it? No, I don't have it. It's in the, it. no, it, it's in the same bedroom? Time. What? It's in a different bedroom. Which bedroom the, is it in? It's in the bedroom across from him. Where we keep the guns. Please Okay, I've got people on the way, okay? Oh, you don't you do not have the gun, right? No, I don't. Okay, where are you? I'm outside by the truck. Outside by the truck? No. What happened? I don't know. I just You I don't know what happened? Him. You just shot him? I've been What? I don't I don't know. I don't know. In the early hours of February 23, 2017, Mariah Ponder woke up, walked across the hall to her father's bedroom, and shot him while he was asleep in his bed. She then called 911 and was barely able to muster the words to explain what had happened. After the call, the teen left the gun at the crime scene, picked up her backpack, pulled her coat on, and waited outside for the police. When they arrived at the home, her father was still alive. He was taken to Fort Hamilton Hospital, later being transported to Cincinnati Medical Center, where he died from the bullet wound. In a later search of the house on Millville Avenue, police found a 9mm handgun and a Cobra 380 semi-automatic pistol, along with a blood-soaked pillow, a book bag, an iPhone, four computers, and one notebook. None of these have divulged any reasoning as to why the teen carried out the shooting. The rest of the Ponder family, the teen's mother and five siblings, were not at home when the father was shot. However, the family paid the $300,000 bond to release Mariah from custody, much to her sister, Angel Phipps's disdain. Phipps said, it's not like she will be monitored every day or she is not going to see friends. She is still my sister, I love her dearly, but she still killed my father, and I don't think that we should have to live in this prison, and she gets to go home, adding that the release was a step in the wrong direction. The girl's brother, James Ponder Jr., visited his sister in jail, but they couldn't speak about the murder. He's maintained that there was no abuse in the household, and Mariah and her father had a normal relationship. Those close to the family have agreed with the notion that James was not abusive, he was a good father to all of his children. The strangest part about the Ponder case is that James didn't allow firearms in the home and didn't own any himself. According to records, Mariah had not bought any either, something the family considers key evidence to get the answers they need. The Ponder family strongly believes a relative close to them had coerced the teen into the shooting, even obtaining the gun for her. Since the day of the shooting, the police haven't questioned what the weapon was doing in the house. Additionally, the rest of the family has not been spoken to by investigators. In March 2018, Mariah Ponder and her family cried as she was sentenced for her father's death. She will serve six years in juvenile detention, and if she behaves, she may not have to move to an adult facility for the additional 15 years to life handed down to her. At the sentencing, her brother still questioned who the teen worked with, saying, I've continually asked what my father's last words were because I feel like he would have told us that Mariah was not the only one to blame. Investigators have never said why Mariah Ponder shot her father, and no other suspects have been questioned in the case to date. On September 30th, 2005, 
10-year-old Robin Doan woke to hear her mother screaming in fear. Five shots from an AK-47 rang through her family's remote Texas farmhouse, and then there was silence. The elementary student peered through the crack of her bedroom door, watching as a man dressed in black came out of her mother's room and started to walk down the hallway toward her. The young girl hid under the covers of her bed, but shortly after, the stranger entered the child's bedroom, pointed his weapon at the bed, and fired. Miraculously, the bullet missed Robin, instead going through her pillow and hitting a plastic drawer. In an act that certainly saved her life, the 10-year-old grunted as if she had been hit and froze. The intruder left and went into the next room where he killed her 14-year-old brother. The killer then took some food from the kitchen and left the Texas home in a truck he had stolen earlier. The young girl didn't move until the sun began to rise. Then, she took the cordless phone from the living room and fled to the driveway where she called 911. Sheriff's office, 911. Ma'am, uh -huh. there was a shootout in my house. Um, I don't know who's alive in my house, so I'm scared. Where are you at? Um, 7142 Highway 70. It's about 13.3 miles out from the bowling alley. What's your name? Robin Doan, my parents, um, uh -huh. Conrad and Bert Brian Conrad. I'm scared of this and I don't know what Robin to do. Robin Downs? Yes, ma'am. Brian Conrad. I am not know Okay, I'll stay on with you. I've got the ambulance and the fire department to come to, okay? Thank you so much. You're coming. Stay there. You don't see any other vehicles or strange people around your home or anything? No, ma'am. You didn't see a car drive off of any kind? No, ma'am. You just heard the shots fired? Then I heard I saw the lights on in the kitchen, so I'm assuming they stole some stuff. Okay, okay. <gasps> First responders arrived at 7.24 a.m. and found Robin sitting on the back of her stepfather's pickup truck. She said she wasn't hurt and taken into a police cruiser while officers entered her home. Inside were the bodies of her stepfather, 31-year-old Brian Conrad, her brother, 14-year-old Zach Duan, and her 35-year-old mother, Mitchell, who was six months pregnant. Fifteen spent shell casings were recovered from inside the home. The back door was damaged from where the murderer had broken in, and a shoe prints and tire tracks were found at the scene. However, nothing of value seemed to have been taken. It seemed that the man had broken in and gone straight to the master bedroom where he shot Brian Conrad three times, then Molly the pet dog twice, and then pregnant Mitchell five times. The heartless killer would later be identified as 23-year-old Levi King, and unknown to Texas police, he was on his way to Mexico. What makes this already unthinkable crime even more shocking is that these murders were the last in a killing spree that had started 15 hours earlier in Pineville in rural Missouri. Before killing nearly the whole Conrad family, King broke into the home of seven-year-old Orly McCool and shot him and his 47-year-old daughter-in-law, Laura Don McCool, dead. He then continued to Texas, where he stopped at the Conrad's isolated farmhouse on the outskirts of Pampa. The first two victims were found by members of their family who called at their house just a few hours after Robin had alerted Texas police to her family's annihilation. The multi-murderer crossed the border from El Paso, Texas into Mexico, but for some reason he decided to return to the U.S. soon after. When he reached the border at around 9 p.m. on September 30th, he handed multiple IDs to the patrol agent. One of them belonged to Robin's stepfather. He admitted to having weapons and was asked to step out of the vehicle. In the car, he had the AK-47, a 9mm Smith & Wesson, a 380, and a scoped rifle. By this time, Missouri police had identified King as the shooter in the McCool double homicide, and an arrest warrant had been issued for him. When Border Patrol identified him as the wanted man, they called the El Paso PD. The suspect confessed to shooting the McCools, explaining to police that he had gotten angry because his father had kicked him out of his house so he had reportedly taken some guns and gone out to shoot people. 
But the self-confessed murderer kept quiet about the murders in Texas and transferred to Missouri, and authorities in Pompa were at a loss with no suspects or motive. In October, authorities heard that King had told a fellow prisoner that he was responsible for four murders that he had been caught for in Texas. Of course, he had no idea Robin had survived. As soon as Texas Sheriff learned of the inmate's confession and that he had been found with Brian Conrad's ID and an AK-47 at the border, he became their prime suspect. King had grown up in a home littered with weapons and had a criminal past. He had been charged with arson and burglary, but served less than three years of his 14-year sentence and was released to a halfway house. In March 2006, King was charged with two counts of murder in Missouri and three counts of murder in Texas. Both states have the death penalty, but it was removed as an option in Missouri when the suspect agreed to plead guilty. In April 2008, Levi King was sentenced to two life terms without the possibility of parole for murdering Orly and Don McCool in Missouri. Four months later, he first pleaded not guilty to the murders of the Conrad family in Texas, but changed his plea to guilty before going to trial. In Texas, the death penalty was still on the table. A then 14-year-old Robin bravely took the stand and read a victim impact statement. At one point, she faced the killer and told him that her mother's screams from that night still haunt her. The jury began deliberating on October 5th. One juror refused to vote for the death penalty, and so, without the required unanimous vote, Levi King was sentenced to three life sentences without the possibility of parole. Showing great courage, Robin returned to the stand and forgave her family's killer. She said she hoped he would ask God for forgiveness with this time. King was sent to the Eastern Reception Diagnostic and Correctional Center in Bonterre, Missouri, where he remains incarcerated. Robin went through months of therapy and lived a normal teenage life. There were three times shortly after the murders when people would stare, but it lessened with time. Robin keeps in touch with the officers who took care of her on the horrific night, and became a lifesaver herself when she rescued a drowning child. In 2014, she told the Texas Monthly that she wanted to continue helping children by becoming a pediatric nurse. After a night out from having a few drinks on Labor Day weekend 2010, couple Brett McFarland and Catherine Kate Gill returned to McFarland's home in Mashpee, Cape Cod. In the early hours of Sunday, September 4th, Gill got up and went for a snack. Not long after, McFarland heard the horrific sound of his fiance choking and rushed to the kitchen. He dialed 911 and attempted the Heimlich maneuver. 911 recorded line, what is your emergency? Police, fire, or medical? Police. What do you need? You need the police? Your girlfriend shot you? Oh, she's choking to death. Okay, what's the address? <laughs> what is she choking on? <laughs> she what? <laughs> do you know the Heimlich? <laughs> What is your name? What's the phone number? Is she breathing at all? No, she's not breathing. She's not talking to her. All right, the ambulance is on its way. How old is she? She's 31 years old. She won't open her mouth. She won't open her mouth. Open, she's freezing. She's seizing? She's not breathing. Okay, she's not breathing. Okay. All right, what was she choking on? I can't hear you because you're on a speakerphone. She's working. She's, she's peeing her pants now. Okay. Hey. What was she choking on? I don't know. Okay, you need to calm down, okay? The ambulance is on its way. Okay. Okay. Where is she? In the bathroom? No, she's on the kitchen floor. She's on the kitchen floor? Yes. Okay. Does she take any medications or anything? I have no idea. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I have no idea. She, she, don't do this to me, she, 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 she breathes. Is she breathing? I can't tell. You can't tell? Oh, her tongue is swollen. Her tongue is swollen? Uh, How's her color? Uh, 
Her lips are blue. Her lips are blue? Yes, they are. She's got the middle right there. Did she, is, did she, does she have a history of seizures? We have no idea. You have no idea. Do you think she took anything? No. Well, we, I don't know. You guys just don't know here right away. Jake! 
through to the Barnstable County Sheriff's Department and was answered by trained emergency medical dispatcher Rhonda Colburn. McFarland and Gill lived just three miles from the ambulance station, so first responders should have been able to get there within minutes. The situation soon turned tragic as the dispatcher failed to ask for crucial information to help locate the home. The residence was on an unmarked road off of Jackson Road. McFarland had put up a sign that pointed to his house from the marked road, but Hurricane Earl had recently swept through the area and had torn the sign down. Despite a large portion of her job providing life-saving guidance in emergency situations such as someone choking, Colburn didn't ask if Gil showed any signs of getting any air or if she was able to speak or make a sound. Dispatchers at Barnstable County Sheriff's Department received 72 hours of certified training, and according to their guidelines, these were questions that she should have asked. Meanwhile, the ambulance crew had difficulties finding the property, and time was running out. Mashpee Fire Chief George Baker told CBS Boston, Our response was hampered a little by the weather, with a very dark road and poorly numbered homes and mailboxes. My folks responded as quickly as they can. It took six and a half minutes for the ambulance to arrive, and by that time, Gil had already passed away. Her distraught fiancé told reporters, Kate died in my arms. It's hard to think of anything worse than seeing someone you love die right in front of you and not being able to help, McFarland told CBS Boston. I tried and tried and tried, and nothing was working. I looked down on the floor and saw a big marshmallow with a big bite out of it, and I'm like, oh my god. Chief Baker said it was very unfortunate a young woman died. Barnstable County Sheriff James Cummings released a statement in which she took full responsibility for the mishandled 911 call. The dispatcher who failed to follow procedures when taking the 911 call was allowed to remain in her position taking emergency calls. The sheriff's department conducted an internal investigation. Though for Gil's fiance said it was too little, too late. 
No words can express what I go through every day, he said. I miss her so much. McFarlane later filed a lawsuit against the town of Mashpee. It alleged that the town's failure to post adequate street signage at the entrance to the small road leading to his house, along with the inability of the EMTs to find the correct address, had caused both Gil's death and his emotional distress. However, Judge Rufo ruled that Gil's death's original cause was choking on the marshmallow she was eating, and the town wasn't responsible for the tragedy. In a perfect world, everyone would have loved ones to take care of them when they reach old age. But sadly, we don't live in a perfect world. After being sent home from a rehab center, 81-year-old cancer patient Clarence Blackman found himself home alone and hungry. With his shelves bare and physically unable to get to the store, the sick man reached out for help. Hey there, my woman to have this emergency. Okay. Last time I spoke to you was about 3.30 in the morning on January the 2nd, 2014. And they rushed me to the hospital. Now, this is the first time I've been home in this apartment since that time. Now, here is the problem. I'm not imperiled upon life or limb, but what I need is someone to get to the grocery store and bring me some food because I need to eat something. I don't really, I don't need to be transported. I'm here, a place for the family, but I would like to get somebody from Carly Street to bring me some uh, small order and so I can get something to eat. Now, I realize transporting you in a, that's how I was transporting in a vehicle number 24, outstanding, outstanding group of men. So, I don't know how you can handle this without getting out of your bleaching light going in, in this uh -huh. table. Okay. But I do need some emergency services here. Okay, what is your name, sir? Oh, wait, one moment, mister. One moment, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, man. Yes, we're we're going to get someone out there to you. Um, one second. So you need someone to bring the food to you? Yes, please. I, I, I have, I just... I can barely walk, but I mean, we're holding on to a chair, and when John in my wheelchair, here's a couple of ideas just what I, I would like to uh, call it to bring me. I like a, one fresh cabbage, uh, avocado, two bananas, and three Pepsis. What kind, of, what kind of Pepsis? Like, I, I, don't, I don't know diet stuff. I would, no, I mean uh, two liters or... The, the big bottle with whatever that is. Uh -huh. And you want three of them? Three of those. And they, they have an excellent uh, thing of uh, what they call processed ham. It looks like bologna, but it's actually um, uh, extra ham. And, and a pack of that. And uh, maybe a pack of uh, the uh, ready prepared uh, potato salad. Maybe a, a can of beef. And a can of uh, green beans. And I believe. Uh, oh, yes, and this is my absolute favorite in the entire world. Stage is two popcorn. I, I love that. I, I like it. And uh, I believe that'll kind of hold me. Maybe I'll, I'll think of um, tomato juice. And they could get that over the dock. I could stir up something. And the uh, dish television people are on their way to uh, get my television going. So. I, I don't know how you can handle it. But oh, I, I'm not sure either. I'm going to send someone out there to talk with you, okay? That sounds like a good idea, my friend, because I have met some fantastic people with 911. That guy, two boys that took me there. Thank God they, they had to blow the door first to get me out. And, oh, goodness. And anyway, I got to the hospital about 4 a.m. Uh, but I'm, I'm recovering pretty well. Been oh. here in Cape Fear Valley, and I just left uh, the... Uh, Coming in a, a physical rehab place, and they let me go and uh, all that. So I, I, I'm doing better. So you could get me started there. Maybe I can get over there organized. But uh, how old are you? Pardon me. How old are you? I'm 81. Oh, now I'll be 82. Come on. Oh wow, that's fantastic. I tell you one thing, buddy. 
that crew y'all sent for me that night. Uh-huh. And crew, crew 24. That is what and that the group of boys. But anyway, then, the, but anyway, so whatever you can do to help, I'll be there. Yeah, I can't do anything. I can't go anywhere. Okay. I can't, I can't get out of my damn chair. Okay. So you can't, you can't walk. Well, do you have any, what other, what kind of medical conditions do you have? Well, now that I'm home, uh-huh. I have a, uh, I'm in a weakened state. Uh-huh. I can walk with assistance. And I think I've overcome all the other things. I couldn't even walk when I got to the hospital, but now I can walk around the, with my walker inside the building and, and do it fairly well. So once I get something here, I can manage it, because this, this apartment is made for assisted living. Uh-huh. I it's flat. No steps. Uh-huh. Uh, so it's made for, for people like me. That oh, yeah, that's good. Now, you said, did you say apartment? Yeah, hey, hey, hey. Are, are your doors unlocked? I lock the front door with a Okay. I'll look forward to somebody coming, okay? All right, we'll get some out there to talk with you, okay? Okay, buddy. All right, feel better. Thank you. Bye-bye. The elderly man was diagnosed with prostate cancer in 2008. Back then, his wife, Wanda, was still alive, but she passed away from cancer in 2011. In May 2015, when he was released from the rehab center, he weighed just over 115 pounds and had been told by doctors that he had less than a year to live. Usually, when a patient who needs assistance leaves a treatment facility, the Department of Social Services is informed to arrange home help. But when Blackman was discharged, the private rehab center failed to take this critical step. With no immediate family in the area, the US Army veteran was left with no other option than to call 911. The woman who took his call, Marilyn Hinson, couldn't send EMS to buy groceries, but she could. Hungry. I've been hungry. A lot of people can't say that, but I have. You know, and I cannot stand to see anybody go hungry. Hinson noted down his modest request for a cabbage, some cans of beans and beets, some popcorn, tomato juice, and a soft drink. And then, after getting permission from her supervisor, she headed to the store. Two Fayetteville police officers helped her deliver the shopping to the gentleman, who was overwhelmed by their help. It was like a little miracle ringing in my ear, and I thought, well, Jesus, you've answered all those prayers. At just over 115 pounds, it is no stretch to say Blackman is skin and bones and cancer. I got critical cancer. However, the 911 operator's kindness didn't end there. Instead, she said about making him a stack of ham sandwiches, which the recently hospitalized man called a feast. The story was picked up by local media and quickly went viral. People from as far as Canada began to answer his call for help. Calling us directly, folks are calling our call center, folks are dialing 911, basically saying, how can we help Mr. Blackman? So People started to call Blackman too. Team cabbage and Polish sausage tomorrow. The other one is the, is the baked chicken and uh, fresh cucumbers and tomatoes. Speaking to the Huffington Post, the widower said, I've been receiving cards and packages, and people have been showing up at my door with bags of groceries. He felt truly blessed, and his kitchen was soon overflowing with more food than he could ever eat. I want to have every uh, person that goes to bed hungry under a bridge. At least they can go by Salvation Army. They may have to listen to a sermon, but they get some food. Blackman was visited by a social services worker who arranged for a home health nurse to see him twice a week to ensure he didn't slip through the cracks again. HuffPost reported that Meals on Wheels would bring him weekly meals. When the reporter asked how he was, the grateful cancer patient replied, I'm okay now. Right now, it's just wonderful to be loved. I can lay down to sleep at night and say, Lord, they care. They really care. Steve Stevens fatally shot Robert Godwin and subsequently posted a video of the killing to his personal Facebook page. Stevens also recorded a Facebook Live on 16 April 2017, during which he admitted to the murder and claimed he had killed more people. Ah, what the hell? Hello? 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 Hello?
with a C emergency. Oh, yes, I told her three times. Somebody ran in front of my husband's dead and been shot. Okay, what's the address? I told her three times. Okay, you didn't tell me, sir. I'm someone new. What's the address? <laughs> Is this in Cleveland? Yes, 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 ma'am. Okay, and are you right there with them now? No, I don't. I'm not. I'm inside the house. I can see him across the street. Oh, okay. okay. Okay, is he awake at all? No, I don't even have conscious. He's dead. Okay, can you, are, are you able to go out there and see if he's conscious or breathing, please? Um, he's unconscious. I don't, I don't, I don't How know. How old does he look? He's older, really older. 50, 60, 70, what? I want to say 60. Okay. All right. Are you, able, are you able to go out there and see if he's conscious or really at all? No, I'm really not. I'm really about my mom. My mom is older and I got my child with me. Okay, because um, we need to help him until they get there. We do have help on the way, but if we can help him until they get there, sir, if he's shot, where was he shot at? I don't know. Um, yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm just waking up to walk me out of my sleep. Okay. Are you able to go out there and see if he's conscious of breathing so we can help him, sir, if it's safe to do so? Um, yeah. Okay. I'll well, have somebody else to sort that too. Okay. I need for you guys to go and check and see if he's conscious of breathing. We need to help him. We need to help him. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Hold on. I got, some, I got my son in my house. He can't even walk. Okay. Can you... Okay, but I need to, I need to help them help him, so I need to talk to them and go out there. What'd you say? Uh, he said I got another somebody pulled up in the thirteen like he been hitting the ear or head. Okay, is he conscious though? Is he awake? Is he conscious? Well, is he unconscious? Ask him is he breathing. Is he breathing? No breathing. Okay, so we need to help him. We need to get a clean dry cloth or a towel and apply it to where he's bleeding from. No now breathing. We... Hello? Sir, can you hear me? No, I see a white crane car with some tag on No, I'm so I know. Sir. It's an old man. Uh, hello? Yes. Okay, listen, are you going to where the patient is at? Oh, sir. Who was it? Who was it? Sir, sir, listen, we need to help him, okay? Please, please, please. Yes, yes. Okay, Hello. where was he shot at? He's been shot in the head or ear or something. Okay, so is he, we need to go over there and help him now, okay? I need you guys to get something clean and dry and apply it to his head where he's bleeding from. Apply firm, steady pressure. Can you do that now, please? Man, I, got a, I, I got a uh, sound right here. Okay, well, sir, get somebody off the phone that's over there next to him then. Hello? Yeah, take the phone to where the patient is at. Listen to what I'm trying to say. I understand what okay. you're saying as well, but I need you to guys to get something clean and dry and apply to where he's bleeding from. Do it now, and we need to lay him flat on his back so we can open up his airway. Do it now. <laughs> Oh man, okay, okay. Well, that's some like anything, oh, anything clean and dry. I'm telling you, I'm telling you something. I need to lay him on his back. Okay, so is he breathing at all? No, he's not. The sound is right here. The okay, right okay. Here. So, so listen, we need to we need to lay him down flat, flat on his back. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Godwin. 
affectionately known as the Junk Man, was gunned down while scouring the streets for cans. He carried a white plastic bag that could rattle with cans. A bag he vainly tried to use as a shield when a stranger pulled out a gun on a sunny city sidewalk and ended his life. Stevens immediately became a person of interest. According to Cleveland police, the suspect posted a video on Facebook of a fatal shooting and claimed to have committed multiple other homicides. After a national two-day manhunt, Cleveland Police Chief Calvin Williams said police in Pennsylvania received a tip that Stevens's car was seen in a McDonald's parking lot near the city of Erie. Officers caught up with the suspect's vehicle and pursued it for two miles before they forced the car into a spin. Stevens drew a pistol and fatally shot himself. This seemingly random and senseless act shook viewers and left Godwin's family in agony. I feel the same pain today that I did um, April 16, 2017, because a murder brings a different type. Of His wife, Dorothy, said Godwin was her best friend and was a man of peace. Friend, we shopped together, pay you up, but did things for each other, and he was just. Just my best friend beside God, that was my best friend. Mm -hmm. We decided a long time ago that we had six children together, and it's a lot of married couples will never have what Robert and I had in this life. They're going to wish for it, but we were friends. We weren't fake friends either. Mm -hmm. I had a stroke in 2014. Robert came over and washed my clothes up for me. Mm -hmm. You know, Robert took me anywhere I wanted to go. He took me to the doctor. Anywhere I needed to go, he took me. If he had anything, he made sure that I had to. It speaks and to the I kind of person him. he is, right? Yes, he was a man of peace and love. He didn't like uh, a lot of drama. He didn't like, he didn't fool with drama. And he didn't let things worry him like that. How are you holding but, up, Dorothy? Uh, how I'm holding up. Yes, ma'am. By the grace of God, I'm going to make it. By God's grace, I'm going to make it. But I can't sit here and lie and say it's not hurting. It's hurting me because uh, it's hurting me very, very bad because that, that was a true friend. You know, we have friends in life that said they're friends, but they're not. But Robert was a true friend to me. Tammy. Tammy Godwin broke down as she remembered her dad. My father was, if it's 3 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning, he would come see about us. Sometimes I couldn't sleep and I'd call my dad and he'd talk to me. And I just want him to know what he took from us. He took, my, he took our dad. I can't even believe I'm never going to talk to my father no more. Hmm. I can't believe I'm never going to be able to call my father no more. Mm. My heart is just broke. <sighs> his son, Robert Godwin Jr., said he last saw Godwin that morning when his father stopped by his house to retrieve some basketball equipment for another son. Godwin Jr. told reporters, He hugged my wife and me and said, I'll see you guys next time. Local citizens in the Glenville neighborhood remembered Godwin. It's just thank God that this guy was caught because he was around kids somewhere in Pennsylvania and ain't no telling what could have happened there. I'm glad that whatever happened to him, it happened. Whether he killed himself or someone else or the police. Now, I feel a little safer for my niece in laws live right down the street there. And I feel sorry for the guy that got killed. You know, a innocent man got killed. I was praising God that I wasn't here because I could have been out here. My wife, she scared to death. It was just pitiful what happened because the guy that he killed, I see him every day, every morning. He come around here and I feel for the family that's hurting right now. I ain't nothing else I can say, but the guy that he killed was a good guy. He really missed. We just want to uplift his family and get them, keep them in our prayers and make sure that everything will be okay. This won't be the last time that we hear from him because we're going to definitely keep him in our minds, in our hearts, and also be there for his family as well. And thank you for being a great man in the city of Cleveland and bringing greatness. We we'll always love you and miss you. It's been a lot of good. 
Godwin was a retired foundry worker who left behind nine children, 14 grandchildren, and many great-grandchildren. That was my daddy. And then that man killed my daddy for no reason. The 74-year-old was laid to rest on 22 April. His family continues to get by with the love and support from each other. If I didn't have my siblings, my brothers and I sisters would lose my, my family, I don't think yeah, I could have made yeah. it through this. And this just has brought us even closer. Police never found additional victims. Heidi Aileen Truman was killed in September 2012 at the hand of her own husband, Conrad Truman. The cold-hearted killer reported to 911 that his wife had been seriously injured, and later after authorities determined she had died from a gunshot wound, told police that it was suicide. Nine one one, what city is your emergency? What I don't know. Please come quick. Okay, tell me that one more time so I know I have it right. Two twenty south, eleven eighty west, or Utah. Come quick. Okay. And I have officers headed over there. Tell me the phone number you're calling from, okay? I need to know exactly what happened. Who was bleeding? Okay, okay. okay. I need to know who was bleeding. She's like, she's choking, but I can't make out half because she's yelling so loud. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? I need you to pick up the phone for me. 
Hello? I need you to pick up the phone and talk to me. I need you to pick up the phone and talk to me, okay? Can you hear me? They're on their way. I need you to talk to me so I can help you with her, okay? Okay. I, I can help you. I need you to answer the phone, and I need some information on where she's bleeding so I can help you with that, okay? Where is she bleeding? Out of her head. Okay. Are you, is she conscious? Is this is this a trailer park? No, no, it's right across from Trafalgar. It's across from Trafalgar. There's so much blood. Okay, is the blood only coming from her head? Please. Is this a trailer or a house? It's a, it's a house. It's a house. Okay. Okay. Is she is she is she still breathing? Okay, they're on their way. They're almost there. They're just outside. They need to find the house, okay? Okay, are you able to go outside? Yes. Okay, go outside. I sure have an officer there. Is that right, 306 in there? Okay, I have an officer that's outside trying to find you. Can you go out and find him? Can you go out and find him? Okay, go out and get the officer so he can help you, okay? My my officer's outside. Okay, to get help for her, I need you to let the officer know where you're at. Hello? Hello? Okay, I hear I hear a male. Is that the officer on scene? Yeah, that's the officer. Hello? You I guess it's his wife. I guess I guess it's a male or uh, no, I'm talking to a male and it's his wife. The same man who kissed his dead wife's head and feet, apologizing for not shielding her from an alleged bloodthirsty killer turned out to be the same man who murdered 26-year-old Heidi Truman to claim $878,767 from insurance policies reportedly. On the night of September 30th, 2012, police found Truman covered in his wife's blood in the doorway of their home, screaming for help. Truman then led the officer to the kitchen, where the victim, Truman's wife of three years, was lying face down, blood seeping from her head from what appeared to be a gunshot wound. A medical autopsy conducted by Dr. Edward Leas determined that the young woman's death was a homicide and confirmed that a bullet caused the wound and that the gun was fired at a close range. Police were almost immediately suspicious of the supposed grieving 31-year-old husband whose accounts of the ordeal seemed to change with each person he spoke with. Truman reportedly begged Orem Department of Public Safety victims advocate Renee Flitton to find the killer that shot my wife. Minutes later, he allegedly lamented that his wife allegedly took her own life. The man reportedly provided multiple other suicide theories as investigations went on, and eventually, he refused to speak with detectives at all. The officer who first responded to the scene at 220 South 1180 West, Utah, described Truman as being agitated and furious with emergency responders and authorities who asked him to step aside so that they could attend to the victim. He was reportedly threatening to kill the cop and everyone he knew if he didn't save Heidi. Truman allegedly told the cop that someone must have fired the bullet at his wife through sheetrock while he was in the shower. Video footage from the crime scene shows a home, a chaotic mess with blood everywhere, as well as a gun out in the open. Police were unable to uncover more information about what had transpired before Truman called 911, but both he and the victim's blood alcohol levels were just under the legal driving limit, indicating that they had both been intoxicated at the time of the shooting. 
The only other speculations that came to light during the investigation revealed that the couple had been watching the TV drama Dexter on the night of the killing, and some believed that the show had inspired Truman. In July 2013, Truman was arrested and charged with first-degree murder and obstruction of justice. Truman's defense tried to support his actions that fateful night by stating that Truman had not been in the right state of mind, blaming alcohol and shock for his behavior. Truman's defense also claimed that the crime scene was not controlled, as there had been dogs walking around the home and through the evidence, and Truman was allegedly allowed to go to the bathroom alone. However, despite the defense's argument, Truman was convicted the following year in October. He was sentenced 15 years to life on the murder charge and a consecutive 1 to 15 years on the obstruction charge. Truman's brother set up a change.org to petition against what he believed was the wrongful imprisonment of his brother, where he stated that the prosecution misled the jury to convict him. A second trial was granted in 2016, as his first trial had been proven to have inaccurate incriminating evidence. After nearly four years of incarceration, Truman was acquitted of the crime. Truman's attorney stated that he believed that the jury acquitted Truman the second time around because of accurate evidence that made the homicide scenario less plausible. PM on January 30th, 2011, Métis Vasquez Clark called her son, 21-year-old Johnny Clark, who was spending time at his girlfriend's house while her parents were out of town. When she checked in on him, he jokingly told his mother, Yes, Mom, I'm still alive, but that would change hours later. Johnny called his friend, Tiffany Williams, around 10.40 p.m., and at that time, she heard him speaking to someone else. Concerned by the conversation and the lack of communication, Williams convinced a friend to go to the house he was at with his girlfriend, 20-year-old Lisa Straub. At the same time, Mady was trying to contact her son. After 22 calls went unanswered from 10.41 p.m. onwards, she knew something was wrong. The 21-year-old's mother then got a call from his best friend's girlfriend, who was worried about him. Once the parents reached the house, Mady made the first 911 call at 1.21 a.m. for a welfare check. Hello? Toledo 911. Ma'am, mm -hmm. my heart is beating out of my chest. I just got a call from one of my son's friends. Okay. Her phone number, I have it right here. She just picked my husband up, too. My son and his girlfriend live out at Lawn Acre Lane. Mm -hmm. I believe that's Holland. This girl says she was on the phone with my son and his girlfriend, and he was supposed to go pick her up. He was telling her he was going out the door. And all she heard was the phone drop and heard my son saying in the background, who are you? What do you want? What are you doing here? And she said she just drove by the house, and the house looks ransacked. All the lights are on. My son's not answering, and neither is the girlfriend. Okay, you said it was... Yes, Lane. Okay. Oh, my God. Uh, I got heart problems, and my heart's beating out of my chest right now. All right, I understand. Do you know if, if that's all one word, or is it two separate? It's No, it's separate words. Lawn Acre. Yes, Long, Long. L-O-N-G, Acre, A-C-R-E, Lane. Oh my God. Is she still there? No, she just came by here to pick up my husband, my son's dad, and I'm here with the other two younger kids. All right, what is your name? My name is Maite Vasquez Clark. Oh my God. I have the girl's phone number that he was talking to that heard all this going on in the background. Okay. Her she, parents, she my said son's girlfriend. Okay. My girlfriend's, uh, my son's girlfriend's parents are out of town. They left for uh, Puerto Rico two days ago. I don't know how to calm myself down. My heart's beating okay. out of my chest. Okay, what did, what did your son tell her? My son was like, "Hey, Tiff, we're on our way out the door. We're coming to get you." And then all she hears is the phone drop, and my son Johnny saying, "Who are you? What do you want? What are you doing here? Who are you?" And no more, no more answers. That's all she hears. And then she says that she starts getting worried because neither of them are answering the phone. And she goes out there by the house and she sees all the lights are on and the cabinets look ransacked. Okay, but you don't have any idea where your son's at? He was there at the house with his girlfriend. That's where they're house-sitting for her parents. Okay, but, but she doesn't, he wasn't there when she went over there? No, no. She rang the doorbell and nobody came to the door, nothing. Oh my God, ma'am, I'm so afraid something happened bad. 
Oh my god. <laughs> oh. What's your son's name? John S. Clark. Clark is with the E at the end. Is he and white, white, or Hispanic? He's white and uh, Hispanic. He looks more white than anything. How old is he? He's 21. Date of birth is... And the girlfriend is... Okay, is somebody going to meet us over there? Uh, yeah, my husband's on his way there right now. Oh, my God, my hands are ice cold. My heart's beating out of my chest. I do I need to send you medical, ma'am? Please do. Okay, let me get this call in real quick, and I'll send you medical, okay? But I have these kids, okay? Please make the call. Her The girlfriend's name is Lisa Strauss. Okay, what's your husband's name? John P. Clark. What kind of car is he driving? I don't know what the girl's car is that picked him up. I'll give you the girl's phone number. The girl, right. Tiffany. Do you know how long it's going to take him to get over there? Probably 10 minutes. Oh, my heart. My God, I can't take this. What's, what's his girlfriend's name? Lisa Straub. S-T-R-A-U-B. What's her cell number? Um, This is his girlfriend. This is not the girl that called me from the cell number. Okay. The girl that called me is Tiffany. I don't know her last name, and her cell number is... Okay, but we can get a hold of Lisa on that number? No, Lisa's with Johnny. That's what I'm telling you. Lisa and Johnny are boyfriend and girlfriend. They were leaving her mom's house. They were on the phone with this girl named Tiffany, the number I'm going to give you, the cell phone number that I'm going to give you. They were talking to her on the phone when all this commotion went down. I thought the, I thought the girlfriend called you saying that she was on no, the phone. No, no, not the girlfriend, her friend. The girlfriend's friend called me. And she's the one that just came here now to pick my husband up. Oh, my God, please. I'm praying that my son is okay. <laughs> oh, Lord. <sighs> <sighs> All right, stay on the line and talk to medical while they're on their way there, okay? Okay. Hang on. Deputies searched the outside of the home and saw no tracks in the snow. Although the TV was on, they decided to leave since there was no obvious forced entry or other alarming signals. In the meantime, Tiffany Williams called Johnny's father, John, and offered to take him to the house. By 2.27 a.m., Mady's worry increased so she drove to the house to join them and made the second 911 call. Yes, Listen, ma'am, I am a concerned mother. My son was in Long Acre Lane with his girlfriend, house sitting. Lisa Straub lives there because her parents went to Puerto Rico two days ago. I get a phone call about a half an hour ago from his friend Sharita that some girl named Tiffany called her saying that Johnny and Lisa were supposed to pick her up at 11 o'clock. And she was on the phone with Johnny, my son, when he was walking out of his house, his girlfriend's house with his girlfriend to come get her. And supposedly she heard a guy in the background screaming at my son and my son saying, what do you want? Who are you? Get away from us and what have you. Okay. Four cop cars were already out at this residence. They're not there. And her car is in the driveway. I want to know where my son's at. I want to know where my son and his girlfriend are at. I want to know if they got abducted by whoever tried to assault them and rob them. And it's pretty funny that this girl named yeah. Tiffany, which is there right now by the residence, waits two hours to call somebody and report this. Okay. Well, like I said, we were out there. There was nothing going on there. Okay. Where is my son and his girlfriend and her car's in the driveway? Uh, how would I know that, ma'am? I need to report my son missing. Okay. Um, where are you at? I'm coming up to the residence right now. Well, which which residence? Uh, Lisa's house. Okay. I need an address. Long Acre okay. Lane. Can I go too far again? And what's your name? My name is Maite Vasquez Clark. This is the street, I think, Mama. Long Acre. This is it. This is it. This is it. Okay, I'm with my phone? cousin right now that's in the military. Okay. What's your phone number? My phone number is, I want this girl's plate number before we go anywhere so I can give it to the sheriff on the phone. And they're back pulling in the driveway. I want this plate number. Ma'am, I'm going to give you this plate number, okay? Mm -hmm. That this girl's car is driving. I'm going to stay calm. 
I am. Will you stay on the phone with me, ma'am, while I talk to this girl? Don't touch anything. Who are you going to talk to? Ask, okay, listen, here's the plate number. That is the girl's, uh, the plate number of the car that this girl is driving that my son was supposed to supposedly pick up. Now, these two people right here, um, that's Johnny's phone? Oh, I don't know. It's my parents probably. Call them back. Okay, is it, what kind of vehicle is it? Um, my, what kind of vehicle is that you're driving? What is it? A Corolla? I have a feeling you set up my son. My son is missing. He's nowhere to be found. Do you want to tell the police what you just got done telling me on the phone? Okay, come here. Ma'am, I'm going to let you talk to her because I have her blocked in uh, Lisa's house driveway. Okay? Okay. Here. You tell them what you I will. Them. Hello? Don't okay, what's, what's going on? Okay, um, my friend Johnny and Lisa, they were supposed to come pick me up, me and uh, my friend from our house, and this was like 11 o'clock. And, um, he, um, I was on the phone with his girlfriend, Lisa, and then he hung up and, um, we all hung up. He said they were on their way. And then he, I called Johnny right back cause I was going to tell him that, um, I was going to run to the store and then I was, I would meet them at the house. Well, um, he was yelling at somebody like, um, I'm on, he goes, he goes, bro, who, who are you? And then um, I, I called. He called him right back, and he didn't answer. So I texted my friend Lisa's phone, and I was like, um, "Where are you? Are you guys okay?" And they have not answered to me or nothing. They have not answered the phone, and I've been calling and calling and calling. So I drove out to their house after um, my friend's mom got home, and um, nobody answered the door. So I drove back by our house to see if maybe they went to his mom's house and um, he wasn't there. So his dad called my phone and I was like, do you want to ride out there? And he said, yeah. And I brought him out here. And now his mom's arguing with me saying I set him up. And, you know, they're my friends and I'm worried about them. And if I don't have, you know, I'm worried about my friends because they were supposed to come pick me up and they never showed up. Okay. Does anyone have... What's what's the son's name? What's her son's name? Is Johnny? Is that his name? Yeah, Johnny Clark. Does anyone has have, have his phone number? Yeah, I do, but his phone shut off. Okay. And um, she and we was calling, and it was ringing, and then it was shut off all of a sudden. And then I was calling my friend's phone, and I've been texting her, asking her if she's okay, are they okay? Because they wasn't answering. And then I texted her like, "Last I talked to you, um, I heard him arguing." And then now all of a sudden they haven't picked up the phone or nothing. Okay. Are you out? Are there, is there a couple officers? Where are you guys? Yeah, there's some, yeah, there's some officers out here. Okay. Why don't you go talk to them and they can help you, okay? Okay. I'll put his mother back on the phone. Okay. Actually, I don't need to talk to her. She okay. just talk to the officers. Okay. Okay? All right. All right. Bye-bye. Again, deputies responded, spending more time checking the outside of the home. Although they had no probable cause to force entry, one officer allegedly told John, As an officer, I can't tell you to go into the home, but as a parent, I would wait for us to leave, then go in. After heading to a nearby gas station, the parents and the other family members returned, taking the officer's advice. Mady waited in the car while the other two went to the back of the house and looked in. Peering through the blinds, John could see both Johnny and a phone lying on the ground. The father ran back to the front of the house and kicked the door in. Inside, he found his worst nightmare. Lisa was lying on the ground with a bag taped around her face, and his son was nearby with a bag on his head. He ripped both bags off. He prepared to do CPR, but as he lifted Johnny, he knew it was too late. Mady made the third distressing call to 911. Oh my God. You need to get the police out to Long Acre Lane. My son is in the basement tied up of this house. I just saw him through the window. I The police were out here earlier and did absolutely nothing. Both cell phones are on the ground and we can see the people. Him and his girlfriend are tied up in the basement. Okay. All right. We'll get them out there. Get them Cops out here. I told them earlier. Me. need to calm down. We'll get them out there. But yelling at me is unconscious. They're unconscious, ma'am. Oh, okay. You said they're unconscious? 
Yes. Okay. All right. With cell phones on their bodies. With cell phones on their bodies. On clothes with uh, pants on. She only has pants on. Okay. And their hands are tied. Okay. All right. We'll get them out there, ma'am. Oh, my God. Okay. I need you oh to calm God. down. We'll get them out there, okay? Oh, my God. Please hurry. All right. All right. We will. Long Acre. Okay. I have Long Acre Lane. I have the address. We'll get them out there. Goodbye. The friend he was on the phone with just before the incident, Tiffany Williams, also called 911 once the couple was found. Lucas County, 911. Oh my god, uh, we just called the police here. On Long Acre? Uh, yes, but we need a rescue squad. He's got a bag over his head. Okay. Oh, we're going to see through the window, please. We've got them on their way already, okay? okay? I'm sorry. That's all right. Stay on the line. I'm going to transfer oh them to you. Okay? <laughs> okay. Once on the scene, later described as remarkably clean, investigators found parts of the house ransacked. Although it may have initially looked like a burglary, multiple pieces of jewelry were left behind along with envelopes of Iraqi currency. Material from cabinets and drawers were pulled out in the living room and kitchen area, and the contents were dumped on the floor. Lisa's purse was emptied, in the main bedroom, the mattress was pushed off the box springs and clothes from the walk-in closet were pulled out and dumped on the floor. The dresser in the closet was overturned and the panel leading into the attic space was opened. Lisa's bedroom door was damaged as if she had barricaded herself in there before an attacker broke it open. Bags in the garage had been ripped open and a piece of one was found upstairs. Besides those two rooms, the house was mostly undisturbed. Lisa's body was found facing east, her hands were duct taped behind her back. Johnny's head was facing west, his feet were duct taped behind his back and also bound with the black tape. Both Johnny and Lisa had bags over their heads, with those bags secured with duct tape around their necks. The victims both had their upper clothing pulled up, while the lower halves were pulled down slightly like they were dragged across the floor and staged in the kitchen. An empty wallet was found on Johnny's stomach. Outside, despite the recent inches of snow days before, there were no footprints around the home. It is almost certain that the attackers came in through the garage door, which leads into the kitchen. Investigators found damage to the interior of the service door from the garage, speculating that Johnny probably saw the killers as the couple was leaving and attempted to run back into the house. They think, given the fact that he weighed 200 pounds and was likely pressing his weight against the door, there would have been multiple people forcing it open on the other side. A cigarette was found near the door leading from the garage. The deputy who found it remarked that it was odd that there was no ash or smell of smoke in the house, but that cigarette had two sets of DNA that hit on existing samples. Once authorities started investigating, the events of the night became clear. At 10 p.m., Johnny Clark picked up his girlfriend, Lisa Straub, from her job at TGI Fridays. They then returned to the home of her parents in Holland. Mary Beth and Jeff Straub were on a cruise celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary. Johnny and Lisa planned to leave to pick up Tiffany Williams and friend Zach Burkett, then returned to the home to play pool. Williams spoke to detectives in an interrogation. So you're on the phone. How long before you hear anything on the phone? Did you, what did you? Like, as soon as he picked it up, he didn't say hello to me, but he was like, bro, what are you doing? All right, I want to get this down again. Bro, what are you doing, okay? Okay, and he said that approximately three times. Okay. Then the All right, let him, give me his voice. Was it, bro, what are you doing? Or, bro, what are you doing? Yeah, just like that. Was, he bro, sounded yeah. pissed? Yeah. Did he sound scared? No. Not he just scared. sounded pissed? Just pissed, yeah. All right, so you hear, you hear, bro, what are you doing three times? Johnny sounds pissed. Mm -hmm. All right, then what'd he say? Then the next thing he said was, who the hell are you? How many times? Um, Once. And then that's when I heard the other person in the background, but I couldn't hear what he was saying. So you overheard a voice in the background. A guy voice. You're sure it was a guy? I'm positive it was a guy. Have you ever heard it before? No. 
Well, I really couldn't tell. You know what I mean? Right. But Okay. All right. So then what? Then he asked again, bro, what are you doing? After he said, who are After you? the three times he said it yeah, here, he said, he said it said, again. Yeah, and that's when this guy was talking. So that's why I couldn't hear him is because Johnny was saying, um, bro, what are you doing once again? All right. Did you hear anything in the background like a door close, footsteps? It sounded like Johnny was, did he sound pissed here again? Mm -hmm. Did he sound pissed here? Yeah. Did he sound like he was out of breath? No. Did he sound like he was scared or nervous? No. Did he sound like he knew them people? Mm -hmm. That's why I said I think that whoever did it, he knew because... You know, if you knew Johnny... How did, he, how did he end the conversation with you? Tip, I'm going to call you back. And I'm okay, now. William said she didn't want to call the police because she knew Johnny would have drugs on him. Williams had confirmed that Johnny had angrily responded to someone he saw. She said it sounded as though Johnny knew the person and that she had heard another man's voice in the background. Johnny then told Tiffany that he would call her back. A phone log shows that Johnny called a friend at 1041. That friend, who was not being named to protect his identity, later told Johnny's family that Johnny was waiting for Anthony Watson. Along with the cigarette, later crime scene analysis revealed several clues. Several sets of unknown DNA were found on the duct tape around the neck, Johnny's ankles, and in a pocket of Johnny's sweats. At this point, with the DNA evidence collected at the scene, police had their first suspects but also a whole list of questions and many, many other possible suspects. The one obvious thing to investigators was that they were looking for something particular, whoever the attackers were. During the investigation, multiple people said that Johnny had talked about a safe with $100,000 being in the home. However, the Straubs said that there was no money in their house other than the $40 they left behind for their couple to order pizza. The single cigarette butt found matched with DNA of Sam Williams and Cameo Petaway, and was in the house where Johnny Clark and Lisa Straub were murdered. Despite having the same last name, Sam is not related to Tiffany Williams, one of the initial primary suspects. On January 22, 2011, Sam Williams was arrested for the double murder. At the time, he had no idea that he was a suspect in the murder, as he didn't know the couple at all. Williams' arrest began a whole new twist in the case, one that remains unresolved to this day. The self-described man of the streets was involved in some shady business and had a warrant out for a domestic violence case, which was what he initially thought the arrest was for. While recalling the events of his arrest, Williams said as he crossed the street to buy cigarettes, his world exploded. He said, all these marked cars came rolling up. The U.S. Marshals and the detectives had pulled their guns on me and laid me down to arrest me. I had a warrant for one of my domestic violence cases that I was on probation for. I'm like, I've got 30 days in jail, I don't want to do the probation. As the U.S. Marshal was putting handcuffs on me, I said, you really come and get people for misdemeanor domestic violence cases? Ironically, the accused was studying criminal justice. He was also involved in promoting prostitution with his girlfriend, which was his second guess as to why he had been detained. Throughout his interrogation, Williams told detectives he wanted to speak to his attorney. When his case eventually went to trial in July of the following year, the statements to detectives were suppressed because of a violation of Williams's Miranda rights. The most damning information was his denial that he had ever been in the home. It was a question that his defense attorney struggled with at his trial. That's as good as we got. Yeah, that's good. That house looked familiar to you at all? No. Have you ever been to that house since Springfield Township? No. Okay. You sure? I'm positive. All right. All right. Good. I'm 100% positive. All right. Some more names? Yeah. You know what? Uh, I'm gonna throw some names at you. You know, you tell me, you know, you know a uh, Tone Watson? You know Tone? Anthony, Tone. Always hangs I out with a couple, a, I know a couple of Tonys, but not you don't go by Tone. Well, okay. Anthony, Tony, um, hangs with a dude, mixed dude, Zach. 
Fat Zack. You know, Fat Who's Zach. the Tonys you know? Yeah. I know one from the east side. Um, Scarlett, my baby mom's other baby dad, Anthony Wolf. Wolf, W-O-L-F-E? Or? They spell their name different. W-O... E-L-F. Okay. W-U-L-F. Kind of that's Starla's. That was her. That's her other son's baby's daddy. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty good. Whatever you want okay. to call it. Okay. What about a Chris? You know any Chris's? Chris Watson? Chris? You don't know this kid Zach? Fat Zach. They call him. He's kind of a mix. White kid, black kid. About seventeen. You got some pictures? Yeah, yeah we, might got, be able we got to some pictures yeah, we around. Some pictures yeah, we can get you some pictures. Um, names, I don't, I mean, somebody says what about his nicknames? name is Frank, and oh, no, he's, yeah. you know what I'm saying? See, so I don't he's remember. He's Frank, and his actual name is Sam. I'm terrible at names. You know what I mean? So what, I really don't What about know. a dude named Peanut? How about a nickname? Somebody like Peanut, or Manny. Somebody they call Manny. No. You deal much with dudes from the south? No. South side? I'm east side or all the way. You guys see it. The east Can side and south side does not get along at all. Like, seriously. Soon after the interview, Williams's calls were recorded from the county jail and allegedly taken out of context when presented to the jury. News station, Eleven Investigates, claims to have seen the full transcripts and agrees to this. The conversations included snippets of Williams telling his co-accused brother, Stephen Petaway, that was supposed to be me and you, but you know little bro had to step in to take your spot, man. Stephen responds, you know he didn't do it right like I would have did it right. To which Williams responds, no, but he did it good enough to make something happen. Again, the prosecutors pounced on the call, telling the jury that they were talking about the night of the murder and how Cameo had to go because his brother was in jail, adding that Cameo didn't do it right, possibly by leaving behind the cigarette. However, Williams maintained Stephen was instrumental in setting up the prostitution business, and that he was talking about a prostitution trip he took Cameo on to Pittsburgh because Stephen was in jail. Cameo Petaway was tried in a separate courtroom from Williams. However, his case was dismissed by Judge James Bates, saying the prosecutors only presented the cigarette as evidence against Petaway. He stated that anyone could have dropped the cigarette. The state did not have incriminating jailhouse calls or testimony from a snitch. In Williams's case, testimony from the jailhouse snitch, Eric Yingling, likely was the deciding factor. Yingling was in the county jail in December 2011 for failing to pay child support. He told the jury that he befriended Williams and that during a late night conversation, Williams said he was tormented by the sound of the crinkling bag as Lisa Straub tried to breathe. He named Williams, Petaway, and another Eastside man, Eric Taylor, as the killers. Although there were several problems with Yingling's testimony, including the inclusion of Taylor, who was never considered a strong suspect by police and was not charged, his words were instrumental in the conviction. In addition, all the details that Yingling shared were publicly known when he talked to the police. He freely admitted that he was looking for a deal and that his wife looked up many of the details. Yingling was paid thousands of dollars. In May 2021, WTOL 11 lead investigator Brian Duggar interviewed Sam Williams. I was in the county jail. Didn't know who he was. I was very skeptical about him, first and foremost. Um, I have overheard another guy that was incarcerated that um, was a little bit older, pretty much kind of knew that he was somebody that had told previous in the past and um, kind of said, you know, hey, that guy snitches. So instantly my red flags had came up and I just stayed away. He did try to engage in conversation with me. So for me to say that he didn't would be me lying. He did. However, I did not have not one single conversation with him about anything. And when I say anything, I mean anything. Not the case, not my life, not who I was, what I was arrested for, nothing at all. So all the things that he talked about at, at trial, that was all known? I guess it was in newspapers, it was known information? 
Yes. Um, to my knowledge, everything that he had brought up at trial had been either published in the newspaper or it was placed on search warrants and people could obtain that from public information. Even the Iraqi dinar information? Absolutely. They was talking about the Iraqi um, currency on a website called Mock Form. What, what's the website called, Sam? It's called Mock. I have it right here. I have the actual article. I had somebody print it off and send it to me. Mock Forum? Yes. Yeah. I think I've seen that. So they were talking about that. So it's possible that he could have seen it there or somebody told him that information. Well, he admitted in my trial that his wife had researched my case. The biggest question in the case is how Sam Williams allegedly got from the bottom line bar on Star Avenue to the Straub household 30 minutes away. Based on a conversation between Tiffany Williams and Johnny Clark, police believe that Clark and Straub were attacked at 10.41 p.m. A call between Williams and the woman he was having an affair with, Destiny Madrid, at 10.27 p.m. pinged off a cell phone tower near the bottom line bar. At that stage, Williams said he was calling Madrid to see when she would get to the bar. In an October 11, 2011 interview with detectives, Madrid repeatedly tells police that she was with Sam that night and they later went to the Bedford Inn. During the interview, retired Toledo detective Tom Ross, who was working for the prosecutor's office, shushes her. I tell you that you're not on the video with the bottom line on that night. What do you mean? Well, the bottom line has video. Right. You or Sam are not on that video that night. So Detective did not. William says that texts and Facebook posts would prove his story. News station 11 Investigates had reportedly tried multiple times to have Facebook provide the post but has not been successful. The police have not returned two phones of Williams's, though his family has made multiple attempts to get them back. Police did receive a court order to obtain his text messages, but there has been no explanation why they were not used in the trial. Ultimately, he was convicted of aggravated murder, burglary, and kidnapping. His lawyers were able to convince the jury not to sentence him to death successfully, but he was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole. We, the jury, having found Samuel Todd Williams guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. However, the case remains open because of several sets of DNA found on the duct tape, inside Johnny's sweatpants, and on the cell phone pad and battery. There are at least four sets of unknown female DNA and at least one set of an unidentified male. There could be other explanations for that DNA being on the tape, including it being left during the manufacturing process. The DNA was compared against samples from dozens of people interviewed in the case, but the other DNA is harder to explain. If Williams was set up, he was a ripe target. He has been charged three times for domestic violence. In 2006, he was found guilty of threatening to kill his victim. In 2007, he was involved in a fight and charged with felonious assault after punching a man. In 2010, he was found guilty of pushing his ex-wife to the ground and biting her wrist. And in 2011, before his arrest for murder, Williams was found guilty of going to his ex-wife's house, kicking in the door, and threatening to send the woman in his car to beat her up. Another person of interest was Alex Cusino, who had fought with Clark about money in the past. On the night of the murder, Zach Burkett made several calls to the victim and was at a nearby IHOP with Cusino at the time. In November, Anthony Watson, who Clark was supposed to meet up with that night, told police Cusino began calling him repeatedly. He said she often asked about what he knew about the investigation. More concerning was a jealous text message that Cusino sent to a woman days after the murder. She revealed the message at the trial of Sam Williams. I do this, fam. Watch the news. They get duct tape and tied up and left for dead, it read. However, Cusino denied being involved, claiming she was driving around with her boyfriend and smoking weed at the time of the killing. Her DNA was taken and did not match the unknown DNA at the scene. 
Meanwhile, in an initial March interview, Anthony Watson told police that the men were planning to meet up. But when it got too late into the night, he told Johnny that he had to get up early for school in the morning and would not be able to meet. But in November, Watson was brought from the county jail after being arrested on a felony burglary charge to meet with the detective again. He wanted to tell of a conversation he had weeks before with a woman. He said the woman placed herself at the scene of the crime. He also named Sam Williams. The media already knew that Williams had been arrested by this point. Since Watson cooperated with detectives, there is no paperwork or testimony. On September 19, 2018, an unknown person gunned down Watson outside his Macomber apartment. The murder remains unsolved. DNA testing has come a long way since then. The state has also opened a cold case unit, but the unit will only get involved if the prosecutor or investigative agency asks for help. The state confirmed that this has not happened in this case. Williams remains adamant that he had no involvement. Amid the drama and mystery surrounding the double murder, Clark's parents found themselves in their own criminal cases. On December 26, 2014, John and Mady Clark allegedly followed Tiffany Williams into an alleyway and shot at her, just missing her head. The couple then fled the scene. Authorities arrested John after finding him hiding in a back crawlspace bedroom of his home. Police say they found him with rolling papers and marijuana in his pocket. He was arrested and charged with felonious assault, obstruction of justice, drug abuse, and drug possession. Métis Clark was arrested and charged with obstruction of justice after answering the door for police and telling them there was no one else inside. According to an official police complaint, she later admitted that she knew her husband was hiding inside the home. Retired Toledo Police Lieutenant Frank Ramirez was also accused of involvement in the murder plot and sentenced to 48 months behind bars. Métis was sentenced to 24 months behind bars and John to four years. Just a year before, the mother was arrested for menacing after she went to Burkett's mother's home and shone a light inside the windows. She was also accused of driving by the Burkett residence every night and saying she would hunt the victim and her son. The menacing charge was later dismissed. Following WTOL 11's coverage of the case, Tiffany Williams came forward in 2021, saying she would fully cooperate with investigators. Williams said she is sober and in a better place than when the murders happened. She maintains that she didn't call the police when she was at the house because she knew Clark was selling drugs and didn't want to be the snitch. She said she is not involved and does not believe that Burkett is either. But she does have a suspect in mind and is willing to talk to the police about that person, even agreeing to testify if needed. After 11 years, the case remains largely unsolved. Large parts of the background from this call were collected from WTOL's investigation, which was very helpful when making this video. In July 2015, two distressed Tennessee sisters hid from two burglars in a tiny bathroom cabinet as they called 911 and begged them to hurry and save them. At one point, one of the intruders locked himself in the same bathroom to dodge the cops. Um, there's two men outside my house. I think they're trying to break in. They must have got home alone. Okay, stay on the line with me. I'm getting help started to you, okay? Okay. Can you see um, what they look like? They were knocking on the door. One has long hair, kind of, and I don't, I'm not sure about the other one. Okay, was, were they white, black, or Hispanic? Um, I think they're white. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and where are you? We're, we're in my parents' bathroom. Where Where are you inside the house? Um, we're, we're in the very back with my, in my parents' bedroom bathroom. Please hurry. Okay, I'm getting them started, okay? Okay, what door are they at? The very back. It's a, it's a smaller house. Okay, so so the two men are at the back door? Yeah. Okay. I have the call set up. We do have officers that are en route to you, okay? Um, is it possible for you to close the door that you're in? Yes, it's closed. Okay. Is it a lock on that door? It doesn't close all the way. Okay. Stop, 
Okay, how old are you and your sister? I'm, I'm 16 and she's 13. Please hurry. Okay. I, I don't know what to do. I have, I have help on the way, okay? Um, if you can hear anything, let me know, okay? If it sounds like they got in, let me know. I want you to be quiet, okay? If they do get in, don't make any noise, okay? I want you to be quiet. Don't hang up the phone, okay? Just leave the phone where I can hear, okay? Okay. And at any point, if it sounds like they made entry into the house, let me know, okay? Okay. Yeah, a car. You can hear a car? They have a car. What color is the car? I'm not sure. It's okay, is the car in your driveway? They're in the house. They're in the house? Are they in the house? Yes. Okay. I want you to be very quiet, okay? I'm on the line with you. I have help in, on the way. Okay, I have help on the way. They're on the way. They are coming to you. They're getting closer to the bathroom. Are they are they getting closer to the bathroom where you are? Yeah. Okay. I'm updating that information for our officers, okay? They're on the way to you. Okay, I have an officer that's close by, okay? He he's outside. He's he's coming to you, okay? Just stay where you are, okay? until I'll let you know that it's okay to come out. Okay. Okay, I want you to stay put, okay? I don't want you to come out yet, okay? Stay put. Okay, stay, stay put. I don't want you to come out, okay? Stay put. Okay, he's trying to lock himself in. He's trying to lock himself in? Okay, I still want you to be very quiet. Can you tell where in the house he is? Can you tell where inside the house he is? No, no. Why do we know it's okay to come Okay, I just want you to stay put for right now, okay? Don't come out. Don't. Don't make any loud noises, okay? Be as quiet as possible. Okay. We have the police that are outside. They're getting one in, in custody, okay? But I just need for you to keep as quiet as possible, okay? Can you tell if he's in the living room or in a bedroom? No, it's too far. You can't tell? Okay. Um, they know that you're still hiding in the bathroom, okay? Okay. I just want you to keep as quiet as possible. Do you know which room he, he went in? No, I don't know. Okay. Where is he? I think I heard him for you. Where is he? Okay, don't don't come out yet. Okay. Um I have officers who are clearing your house, okay? I want you to Still remain quiet until they come in there with you, okay? Don't, don't be afraid. Okay. We're here. We're back here. Okay. 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 Back here. Back here. 
16 and 13 year old Nashville sisters were home alone when just after 9 a.m., they heard two men trying to break in through the back door. The girls hurried to their parents' bathroom where they hid and contacted 911 for help. As police arrived at the home, one of the intruders tried to dodge the authorities by hiding in the same bathroom the two girls were hiding in, locking himself in. Police managed to arrest the burglars, 31-year-old Brian Tomberland, who at first tried to drive away and was located by a police dog in the woods near the home shortly after. They also arrested 29-year-old Carlos Murillo, who attempted an escape on foot but was quickly apprehended and police charged them both with burglary. Maria was also charged with aggravated burglary as well as possession of burglary tools. At the same time, Tomberlin faced the same charges but was also charged with felony evading arrest as well as driving on a revoked license. Authorities found stolen cash, jewelry, a shotgun, musical instruments, and a computer that they had taken from the Nashville home in their getaway vehicle. The girls were commended for their quick thinking and involvement in helping the police catch the two criminals. You never think this is actually going to happen to you, the older sister said in an interview. I'm most glad that I could help, you know, capture two guys that could have done worse. In April 2014, Ronald Karras called 911 after being hit with a brick, stuffed in the trunk of a vehicle, and kidnapped. 911. Yes, hi. Uh, I'm in the back of a trunk. My license number is. YTG or TT? Yeah. Which one? YTG. Okay, what do you mean? Y -T -G. In the um, they threw me in the back of the trunk. Who? Um, it's um, Deb, um, Jordan, and then another guy. I'm not sure where are you at? Is. Where were you when they put you in I the trunk? I don't know. Where were I'm you when they put like you in the trunk? Around 6th Avenue. We're at on 6th Avenue. Um, I'm not real sure. I need some kind of location so I can start officers in that area. Oh, well, it's got to be somewhere in the 6th uh, Avenue area. In the 6th Avenue area? Well, yeah. It's it's a black impala. A black impala? A black impala. They're out here. I can't talk right now. Sir? Who did this to you? Barb. Barb who? No, I'm sorry. Deb Jordan? Yes. Okay. Uh, we're stopped right now. Can you... Is there a, a lever? Listen, listen. In most trunks, yeah, in your car, I know there's a there lever. Is. There is. There is. Okay, can you pull that lever? But they're in the car. Is the car stopped? I would pull that lever and take off running. I can't get away. Why not? They're right here. They're right here. Did, how long were you in the car? I have officers. I have officers started for the area, okay. but I don't know. I can't say for sure that's where you're at. It's a black impala. What? A black impala. I got that. Is your name Ronald? No. Yes. Okay. Who's Deb Jordan to you? Who is she to you? What? Who is Deb to you? 
told the 911 dispatcher he didn't know where he was being taken. Police officers were able to trace his phone to Prospect Park in Des Moines. When officers arrived, they found a car with a shattered window and Karras in a nearby wooded area. The 60-year-old was found unresponsive and bleeding from his head. According to police reports, he had been beaten with a brick. Karras was immediately rushed to Mercy Medical Center. Des Moines Police Detective Danny White said the 911 call was disturbing. The whole thing is just disturbing. It doesn't matter how many times you listen to it, I've listened to it probably a hundred times and it gets me every time I listen to it. The detective was relieved they arrived on time to save Karras. I think had we not gotten there when we did, then he he definitely would have probably perished in the in the woods. Deborah Oliver and co-conspirator John Deering were arrested and charged with first degree kidnapping. The pair kidnapped Karras because they believed he had money on his person. Oliver was sentenced after a jury convicted her of first-degree kidnapping, attempted murder, and willful injury in October. Following a bench trial, the district court found Deering guilty of kidnapping in the first degree, attempt to commit murder, and willful injury. Karras suffered severe brain damage. The victim's stepdaughter, Jackie Martin, testified that he needed 24-hour care. For a while, he had a hard time recognizing family members. Martin looked directly at Oliver during her sentencing, telling her that the beating left Karras unable to attend his step-grandson's football games or have conversations. Sadly, Ronald Karras died a year later from the complications of the brutal attack. In February 2020, Alicia Miller called 911 to report that she was drugged with a tainted cupcake by a woman named Juliet Parker. Parker posed as a baby photographer in an attempt to steal Miller's baby. Megalade with status of the emergency? Yeah. Okay, what's the problem today? Uh, my girlfriend, she's sick, uh, uh, like, not sure if it's an allergic reaction or if there was possibly something in the food that somebody gave her. Uh, um, but like, she's been puking. Um, I'm super spacey, like, it's hard to talk, and, like, my hands and my feet and my arms are super numb. Is Are you having difficulty swallowing? I feel like my breathing is jacked up, too. Okay. Do you feel like your yeah, throat is swelling? I don't know. Like, my face is numb, like, up to my cheekbones. And I've puked like five times now, and I don't know if it's an allergic reaction or if they drugged me with something. Cause I was fine, and then I ate a cupcake. I ate one, I was fine, I ate another one, and then my face started instantly going numb. Okay. And okay. then they kept asking if I was getting tired or not. Where was this at? Like something at my house. Like, something's wrong with me. Who Do you think someone might have drugged you? Yeah, I don't when know when did if this they happen. Me or, um, at like seven when I ate the cupcakes. Who are the people that might have drugged you? Where are they? 
uh, they're gone now. They uh, were my uh, base. My kids is photographer. Okay. They gave you the cupcake. Yeah. Okay. I tell right. you, something's wrong with me. Like, okay. I don't feel good. Yeah, I'm we're gonna get safety. somebody out there. Okay. When did you have the cupcake? A, uh, so so. It was about that same time frame. So she gave me a glass and it was it ended up being wine. And I had a sip of that when I okay. found out it was wine. Okay. And then she gave me the cupcakes that okay. I ate one. It tastes okay. fine. And then the second one, I instantly started feeling. Okay. Like and you started, started getting the reaction. Have you ever reacted yeah. to food like this before? No. Okay. All right. What's your name? Elisha, E-L-Y-S-I-A. Alicia, did you also want the police to respond to report this? No, at the moment, I just need to figure out what's wrong with me. Okay. Because after they left, like, I couldn't find my house keys or my car keys. Okay. So they were missing. Are you sure you don't want and the then, police to also contact you? I guess they can. Yeah, that's PD, fine. are you still on the line? Now, let me get you transferred back over to the police, okay, Alicia? Only because of the suspicious nature, Okay. Mm -hmm. So just a second okay, here. thank you. Yeah, you bet. Alicia, go ahead and talk to my partner, okay? Okay. Hey there, Alicia. This is, this is the police dispatch. Okay, sounds like they got a place found it for you. The person that you didn't talk to, are they still there with you? No. No, they're not? Okay. Okay, and uh, who do you think it is that drug deal? Uh, they were my, photo my photographer for my kids. Okay, and how long ago were they with you? Uh, they were here about seven, and then they stayed for like a couple hours, and then they left. And when they left, I couldn't find my car keys or my house keys, and then she ended up saying that she had them with her for some reason. And she said she took them by accident and didn't know she had them, and then she had someone put them back on my front door, but wouldn't tell me who the person was, just a friend of hers. Okay. Yeah, it's... It's weird. Like, I don't know what's wrong with me. I was fine. And okay. at cool. four so, when I got home, I was like, Did the person ever actually return your keys? Yeah, they brought my keys back. Some van, she had a friend bring them back. So you do have your keys, But though. I was, yeah, I have my keys now. And I was fine until I ate a cupcake. And then after I ate the cupcake, I made a comment about my tongue and my face started tingling. And then it's gotten worse after that, after that. And then they kept asking me if I was tired and how I was feeling. Okay. And then... Think there was drugs in the cupcake? I think there was, or it was like an allergic reaction, something, but it's not adding up. Okay. Like, there's something wrong. Okay, gotcha. What is, what is your what is your first and last name? Elisha, E-L-Y-S-I-A. Okay. Let well, me get a phone number for you, Elisha. Still there? Yeah. Okay. What's your photographer's name? Okay, what's her name? Oh. Juliet Parker. Juliet Parker, okay. Is she white, black, is she Hispanic? She's white. How old is she? Uh, 40s. 40s, okay. What's your date of birth? Okay. I'll go and let you go. Okay, I know you're having a hard time giving me info. Um, if anything changes, just give us a call right back and let us know, okay? Okay, thank you. No problem, bye, bye Alicia Miller was expecting to meet up with a photographer to have some memories snapped of her newborn child. Photos that she could look back on as her baby grew up. What she was not expecting was to be drugged with laced cupcakes and her newborn daughter almost stolen from her. Juliet Parker, who had run for mayor at Colorado Springs the previous year, had posted advertisements posing as a baby photographer on a Facebook group for moms. She offered a free photo shoot to babies less than 14 days old, or to mothers at least 37 weeks pregnant, and Miller responded, requesting the service offered. According to police reports, the two had met three times at Miller's home. The first two meetings were incident-free, and Parker seemed to be who she said she was, but that was far from the truth. At the third meeting, Miller was allegedly pressured into eating lace cupcakes by Parker's teenage daughter. Miller began to feel giddy and unwell. She felt her arms and feet becoming painfully numb, and she knew that something just wasn't right. 
She hastily asked the two women to leave and was able to contact 911 and report the incident before the drugs took over completely. Before Parker and her daughter left, Miller allegedly saw them stealing house keys and wiping their fingerprints off surfaces in the home. During police investigations, it was confirmed that the cupcakes were laced with the drug GHB, also known as the date rape drug. Police also discovered other possible victims who had reported their interactions when meeting Parker, who had been operating under pseudonyms like Juliet Gaines and Juliet Noel. Further evidence of the attempted kidnapping was brought to light when authorities discovered a text message sent from Parker's daughter suggesting the abduction of an infant to her mother's ex-boyfriend, as well as another one of Parker's exes from Colorado Springs. They came forward to report that he had received a call from Parker telling him that she had just given birth on February 5, 2020, the day of the attempted kidnapping. Parker and her juvenile daughter were arrested on February 14, 2020, and Parker faced charges of second-degree kidnapping and second-degree assault. Her bail was set at $150,000, which the alleged kidnapper posted for a second time and walked free after pleading not guilty in court, despite police previously taking her back into custody after she posted bail for the first time due to her being a flight risk. According to her LinkedIn page, the former mayoral candidate has had very little social media presence since the chain of events, but is reportedly still the CEO of an NGO to feed the homeless. As of now, Parker is awaiting trial for the judge's decision, and her daughter still awaits her trial in juvenile court. In February 2020, a mother begged a 911 dispatcher to send help when her two daughters were attacked by one of the children's fathers with a machete at their Florida home. 47-year-old Dennis Reed also assaulted the caller, but she escaped unharmed. She's screaming and crying and I asked what happened. They said, she, she said her baby father took up our daughter. Come, come. How old is the, how old is the daughter? <laughs> Could you please send somebody right now? Okay, ma'am. What happened? I don't know. I just in the shower and I heard my kids start crying now. I want to come down. My daughter said my baby father. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Can I explain? He left. Please. What, who did what to whom? Are you standing somebody right now? Ma'am. Away, ma'am. What they happened? Just, I don't know if they got shot or what. Just How many people are hurt? My two children. How old are they? Ma'am, don't yell. I know one you're excited. One is 11. Please just send somebody. My, one of them almost passed away. I'll, I'm passed out already. Please. Okay. How were they Let injured? The How were oh, they injured? They're injured very bad. One is like shot in the neck and one is shot in the face. I don't know if it's got shot. I don't know what it is. Okay, who I mean, did this? I mean, never talk in, talk them, who did who this? My Annika, mom, okay. Who did it? My my kid's father. Okay. My kid's father, ma'am. Okay, and where did he go? What type of car is he I in? I don't know where he left. I don't know where he went, ma'am. Do you know what type of car he drives? In her hand. She's shot on the head too. Please. Listen oh, to my. Mom, listen ma'am. to me for a minute. <laughs> Ma'am, ma'am, the police, the police and the paramedics are on the way. Okay, I need you, I need you to go back to the children and let me know if they are conscious and breathing. Yeah, they're conscious, but um, my, my, my daughter said she can't see her hand. Okay, your daughter is conscious. What about your son? No, it's both my girls. Ma'am, my, my daughter is chopped in the head, ma'am. Okay, okay, which one is that? The 17-year-old or the 11-year-old? The 17-year-old, ma'am. Okay, and the 11-year-old? The 11-year-old is shot in the neck. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, baby, I'm coming. Oh, my God. Okay. Were your children <laughs> shot with a gun or cut with something? Ma'am, I don't know. She, 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 she said she just woke up and saw him in front of her, ma'am. I don't know if it was, it, I don't know if it was, the, if, if it was a gun or a machete, ma'am. Okay, I you don't know if it was a gun or a machete, okay. No, I, I'm not sure, but it looked like she was caught. So Go to your children so we can see if we can help them with the bleeding. <laughs> oh, my God. My mom said 
over the machete because he pulled the machete after her. Okay, so he tried to also attack your mom? She's in a, yeah, she, she tried to attack my mom, too. Okay. You okay, baby? Stay with me, please. Stay with me. Stay with mommy. You hear me? Stay with mommy. Reed had reportedly been making several attempts to reconcile and mend his relationship with his ex-wife prior to the day of the attack. According to the police, Reed had arrived early that morning to look after the girls while his ex-wife prepared to fly to Jamaica. Allegedly, Reed had discovered that his ex-wife had remarried a man living in Jamaica, and it is speculated that this is what triggered his attack. The police report says that when Reed arrived at the home early that Friday morning, his ex-wife had been in the shower. Reed then supposedly picked up the machete and attacked his 10-year-old daughter and 17-year-old stepdaughter. Their mother heard the screams and ran downstairs, where he allegedly threatened her before running and tossing the machete into the yard next door and fleeing the scene. Her seven-year-old witnessed the attack, but was also unharmed. It is unknown whether he brought the machete with him or if he found it at the home. Dennis Anthony Reed faces two counts of aggravated child abuse and two counts of attempted murder for the attack. In his first court appearance, he was held without bond in Broward County Jail and ordered to make no contact with the children. Both girls were sent to Broward Health Medical Center for recovery and were brought there in serious condition. There haven't been any further updates as to their condition. When Asua Lizcano left her house for breakfast, she had no idea that the man she was meeting with would turn on her. In January 2015, the brave woman called 911 when she was being kidnapped. Liz Connell pretended the call was to a friend. Is there somebody there that doesn't allow you to talk or, or what? Mm-hmm. Yes. No, this place right here. What's the name of the place? Oh, the Drury Inn. Drury Inn. You see on the freeway, yes or no? No. You see on Highway 6? Yes. Hello? Yes, you still there? Yes. Is there a cop behind you? Yes. yes. Can you go outside? Yes, I probably can, but I don't want to get out of the police station right now. That Monday morning, Christopher Naiwo called Liz Cano and offered to take her for breakfast. But as soon as she was in the car, he insisted that they were going to Austin. The two had met through a mutual friend a week prior. Naiwo said he had a court appearance in Austin. He was facing a trespassing charge there. Liz Cano's iPhone showed a 35-minute call to 911, which eventually led Precinct 5 constables to locate the vehicle in West Harris County. They were able to pull the car over without additional incident. Nywoke was charged with unlawful restraint in Houston. The victim said she'd learned a valuable lesson and urges women to be more vigilant, be a queen. And our final hero actually met the little one she saved. Erin Fennell quickly dialed 911 when her three-week-old son, Parker, suddenly stopped breathing. Fennell was connected to MedStar emergency medical dispatcher, Valerie Carson, who helped save baby Parker. Our ambulance, what's the address of the emergency, please? Please verify the address and the phone number. Please tell me exactly what... Not responsive. Um, I'm trying to shake him, I mean, like, grab his arm, and he's just not responsive. He's not listening. Like, if I yell his name, nothing. Okay. Are you with your child now? Yes. How old is the baby? Three weeks. How old? Three weeks. Okay. Is he okay? Um, I got the ambulance. Start your direction. I'm just going to get a couple of in, pieces of information from you. Okay. Give me just a okay. second to catch the computer up with us. Okay. Now, okay. is he is he breathing? No. Okay. All right, ma'am. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you how to help him. Okay. All right, okay. Okay. Listen carefully. Okay. Are okay. you right beside him now? Yes. Okay. So, what I want you to do is I want you to lay him flat on his back on the floor and move anything under his head, okay? Okay. You know, next time I'm looking at his mouth for food or vomit. Is there anything in his mouth? I don't think so. Okay, all right. So, place your hand on the baby's forehead, the other hand under his neck and shoulders, and then slightly tilt his head back. Put your ear next okay. to his mouth. Can you see or feel or, hear, or feel or hear any breathing? Um, no. Okay. So I'm going to tell you how to give mouth to mouth. Completely cover the baby's mouth and nose with your mouth. Then blow five puffs of air into the lungs, about a half a second each. Just enough to make the chest rise with each breath. Okay. 
Did you feel the air going in and out? He kind of made a cry, but he's still not really responsive. Okay. 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 But did you feel the air going in and out? Not, um, maybe. Okay, tilt his head back just a little bit more. Okay. And then completely cover his mouth and nose with your mouth again, and then blow five puffs into his lungs about half a second each, just enough to make his chest rise, okay? okay. Did you feel the air going in and out? Oh, my God, he's turning purple. Um, okay. I felt one go in. Okay, all right. All right, so listen carefully. I'm going to tell you how to do chest compressions. Make sure he's flat on his back on the floor. Place two fingers on his breastbone in the center of his chest right between the nipples, okay? Do you understand so far? Yes. We're going to push down on one inch with only your two fingers and touching the chest. Pump his chest rapidly five times, at least twice per second. Let the chest come all the way up between pumps. Do it now and tell me when you're done, okay? Ready? Okay. We're going to go at this rate. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. Stop, okay? Okay. Okay. Now, check in the baby's mouth. Okay, so, okay. So what we're going to do now is put your hand under his neck and shoulders again and slightly fill his head back again and put your mouth over his mouth. You're going to give him one puff of air, then pump the chest five more times. Make sure your fingers are on the breastbone in the center of the chest right between the nipples, okay? Do you understand? Okay. Yeah, five more breaths and then yeah, five, five more. Five five more no, one pump, five pumps. Five, one breath, five pumps. So now we're, breath, going to, we're going to give him one puff and then five pumps, one puff and then five pumps, okay? Keep doing it until they can. He's breathing a little bit now. He's making noise. Okay, so then let's stop for a second. Let's time his breathing to see okay. if it's effective, okay? I want you okay. to say now, every single time he takes a breath in, starting immediately. Now. Next one. Now. Next one. Now. One more. Now. Okay, good. He's breathing at an effective rate, okay? Yeah. We're going to stay right okay. there. Stop. We're going to stay right there with him, okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And we're going to stay right there with him. Make sure his head is slightly tilted back. Check his breathing often. Be sure to keep okay. him warm, okay? If the baby okay. vomits, turn him on his side and clean out his nose and mouth. I'm going to stay on the line until help arrives. Tell me when the paramedics okay. are right with him or if the, or with the baby or if anything changes, okay? Does the breathing okay. slows down or anything else? Okay. okay. Just keep him right there. You can keep him on his side, okay? His breathing slows okay. down. You need to let me know, okay? Okay. Okay. Just make sure you keep his head slightly tilted, tilted slightly back, and don't stop until they're with him. Don't leave them alone until okay. they're right there with him. Now, is your door unlocked? Yes, it is. Okay, great. Just let me know when they get inside with him. They're coming as quickly as possible to help him, okay? Okay. Was, did he, was he premature or anything? Um, no, he was um, actually past due, but he does have a cleft lip and palate. He's a cleft palate? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. You can try to console him to keep a close on and make sure that that breathing doesn't change, okay? Okay. If it slows down, you let me know, but they're coming as fast as possible to help him, okay? They're, they're here. Okay. Are they yeah, inside no, with him? The they're almost, they're inside, but they're not here. Let me know when they're inside okay. with him, okay? You, okay. Did, you did a great here. job with him, okay? Thank you. Mm -hmm. He's okay now. Okay. Okay, I'm going to let you go, ma'am. That's take good care until the paramedics get there, okay? Okay, thank, thank you. you. When Parker began to cry that day, Fennel tried to calm him down, but he soon became quiet and unresponsive. Carson deduced that little Parker's heart had stopped beating and began to walk the mother through CPR. Although her voice was shaky, she managed to not panic. After a few minutes, Parker let out a shriek. Both Fennel and Carson had a sense of relief. The dispatchers stayed on the line until the first responders arrived. Fennel got the opportunity to meet the woman who saved her baby's life. She expressed gratitude and said, I'm never going to forget her name. I'm never going to forget her face. I'm never going to forget that phone call. She is the reason Parker is here, and we're grateful forever and ever. Carson has been working with EMS for 40 years and has spent the last 30 years as a dispatcher. Is there a particular call that stuck with you that I haven't featured here? Comment below and watch this episode next.